You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most important topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 321st edition of Assembly Call Radio and our 997th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of January 4th, 2024. I'm your host, Andy Bottoms. Since I cannot hear the music, I will just dive right into the banner moment. Uh, I heard it faintly at the beginning, Coach, but I did not. Uh, I did not catch it this time. Yeah, it's coming across as if it's like muted. Oh, now I hear it a little bit. Let's just plow on without music. Yeah, uh, I did. I did actually hear it. Uh, all right, so we'll uh, we'll begin with our Who's Your Proud banner moment uh, on the heels of last night's game. Felt like uh, a stretch to find a banner moment, uh, a second banner moment from the IU Nebraska game. Jared was tasked with finding the first one last night. So uh, what better way than to look at the IU women's team who came out and made their first 15 shots uh, at home tonight against Michigan uh, in route to an 80 to 59 victory over the Wolverines. Uh, IU is, is playing really well of late. Uh, had a number of players uh, put up some put up some pretty uh, pretty gaudy stat, stats, uh, led by Mackenzie Holmes, who had 20 points, a couple others in double figures, but uh, just came out absolutely on fire uh, against a solid Michigan team. And so, uh, as you look at as you look at IU and 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 what they've done so far, uh, they've got their own game with Nebraska coming up over the weekend, and I'll be on uh, doing the work with uh, with Jeff after the show, and hopefully the uh, the the women's team emerges feeling a little bit better about themselves than the men's team probably did after last night. But, uh, but for me, banner moment was a, just a, a great performance, another great performance. And I think the 11th win in a row, maybe 10th win in a row, uh, 10th or 11th, uh, for the, uh, for the women's team. And so they, uh, they sit atop the big 10 at this point with an undefeated big 10 record. And so, uh, hopefully lots more victories coming ahead for them. All right, let me introduce my co-host for this week. Jared is out corralling a bunch of elementary school kids at a sleepover at his house. He may need uh, some escape to be on, so uh, but uh, I'm sure he has his hands full there. But here with me, we do have a longtime high school basketball coach in the state of Indiana, the founder of Delphi Bracketology, and a man who knows how to celebrate a road win in your rival's gym. And it- he remembers the days when the movie cost a dollar. Hey. Hey, I'll just I, could, go start I actually with, could I'll hear it a little bit. The, it was just kind of choppy, but it, I, I could actually hear it. So, but uh, yeah, the first one were muted. This was just go ahead and uh, yeah. you, know, you can sing the song on your own. You can do whatever you want. I, Cut the music. Just, just go without it. I'm just like Indiana basketball. I got to get over the hump on this new sound. Board. Yeah, there's something uh, that's, that's not working. Yeah, the banner moment part's hear. running now. No, I can hear you. This the okay. sound for the banner moments running. Just now. shut off all the music sound, whatever. Yep, let's, I will. Let's just do an I old school podcast. Oh, it says tonight. says the person who's never hosted. Like you're oh, right. Let, me tell, no, I let am. me tell you how to turn hey, it. Hey, you off. know what? I'm not on the host level. I'm sort of above that kind of directorial. <laughs> you, and... you most certainly are not. <laughs> he's the he's, anyway. <laughs> he's the executive producer. Yes, exactly. Um, all right, coach. So so anyway, uh, my bad on all of that. My goodness, I suck at that stuff. But um. Indiana basketball. I love Indiana basketball. I love everything about Assembly Hall. I love the tradition. I love what Indiana basketball is. But right now, I don't like Indiana basketball. I put that in in the Substack chat today. I don't like the way they're playing. I don't like the results, even even when they they won. So, um, you know, it just better basketball is around the corner. Hopefully, uh, we saw it last year with a, a bad three game stretch in the beginning of the big 10 after Christmas break. And then all of a sudden there's a turnaround. That's the whole, if, if you're uh, positive, that's what you got to hang your hat on, uh, is that, uh, Indiana has played better in the back end, the big 10 tournament in year one of Woodson, and then the turnaround last year. Uh, if you are going to look at things in a little bit negative light, uh, then, uh, Indiana has only played well in about three and a half games total uh all year 
uh, with uh, enough talent to be better than that. Uh, and yet they're, the, the positive, again, is they've won 10 and only lost four. They're not under 500 like UCLA or some other big schools. So really it's what you guys want to do as fans and, and what you want to hear, positive or negative, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle of all of that. Uh, and Indiana does play better at Assembly Hall, and I wouldn't be shocked, and we'll talk Ohio State here coming up, I wouldn't be shocked if um, – you know, they have a good performance uh, coming back after after a tough performance last night. So I, I'm still searching for how to how to judge this team, how to feel about this team uh, and, and try to analyze it fairly. I think a, a lot of us are. So um, that that's that's where I stand at the moment. You're definitely not alone in that respect, coach. Uh, but also with us this evening, he's a senior writer for the Big Lead, the world's most famous unemployed shot doctor, and a man who hears all of your complaints about the increasingly cold winter weather, but just can't relate to them as he basks in the San Diego sunlight. Ryan, what's your rant this evening? Yeah, uh, don't worry. I'll get hit. Way. Every year we go to Bloomington, it seems to be the worst weather weekend of the year in Bloomington, so I'll get my fill uh, when we're there in February. Um, you know, I, I said last night on the show that that or, you know, and I, and I said it on Twitter as well, that, that last night showing at Nebraska was a program wide failure. It was players, coaches, whoever, uh, it was a failure. You lose by 20. I mean, essentially what was 20 points to Nebraska, you need to start looking at yourself and what you're doing and make some changes. And, you know, if it were a one-off and they played really well this year, and this is just a, a game, you, you just flush it and move on. This was an indication of how they played this year. I mean, you look at Ken Palm. I know it's not the end all be all of, of where teams rank, but Indiana's 92nd right now in Ken Palm. Uh, they're 93rd in offensive efficiency and 105th in defensive efficiency. That doesn't happen in one game. That happens during a, the, over the course of a season. Uh, they're the second to last Big Ten team in that ranking by the metrics. Uh, that's that's not acceptable. It's unacceptable. I don't care if you got a lot of young guys. You got two senior leader guards back. You've got, you know, two guys who will probably be playing in the NBA someday and in where and in where and Baco. Um, you've got leadership. You have a senior in Anthony Walker who's been far in the tournament, whatever. I mean, you've got guys on this team. And so the idea I've heard people say, like, well, you know, they lost TJD and they lost Jalen Hutcher. That's not an excuse for this drop off. It isn't. And this team was always going to take a while to get together, but we haven't seen them do that yet. And it's January. It's time for that to start happening. And what we saw at Nebraska is something that was indicative of the way they've played this year. They don't play defense. They don't guard the three-point line. And then on offense, it's all just post-basketball. And, and Ryan Carraza from inside the hall did a great breakdown of what happened when they actually opened up the floor last night a few times on drives for, uh, for Xavier Johnson. And they got easy looks. But typically, that's not what they do. It, they slow the game to a crawl, toss it into the post, and try and work off of that. And it's an antiquated offense. It's an antiquated system. And defensively, I don't know if these players are equipped to run Mike Woodson's defensive system because they don't look any better now than they did in game one and in the exhibitions. They have not gotten better. So it's time for Indiana to start shifting what it's doing. I think, I think they got a great shot to be Ohio State on Saturday but they cannot keep doing what they're doing and expect new results. And there are problems here that need to be addressed because we're in the teeth of the schedule. Now there's no more learning curve. You've got your, you're in the deep end. So I, I just, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I'm the scene's certainly not over. I don't want to sound like that, but there just has been very little adjustment and improvement with this team since day one. And we've seen flashes of really good stuff but we have not seen that consistently It's consistent improvement we were hoping for. So I don't know what's next. I really don't. And I'm like, coach, I love Indiana basketball. I'm going to root for Indiana basketball. I will be yelling at the TV on Saturday, just like everybody else, but I don't like what I'm seeing right now. All right. Well, uh, we'll get into some of those issues because we got a lot of good mailback questions, which is going to be the bulk of the show tonight. Um, but before that, uh, we will get into an Ohio state preview. <coughs> Could feel that coming, just couldn't stop. It. Uh, so we'll do that. We'll look at a couple of Hoosier headlines, uh, and and then we're going to get into a mailbag, which we've kind of split up into a few different parts. We got a ton of good questions uh, on the Substack. I kind of split those into, you know, coaching slash scheme type questions, player related questions, and then some other big picture questions. So we'll, we'll kind of take them that way 
uh, to at least give a little bit of flow uh, to that piece of thing. So uh, all that coming up on this week's Assembly Call Radio. But first, uh, we want to talk about our presenting sponsor, Home Field Apparel, because this edition of Assembly Call Radio, just like all shows on the Back Home Network, is presented by our friends at Home Field Apparel, where they have the largest collection of vintage IU apparel that you'll find anywhere. And it's not just IU. Home Field has something for fans and grads at pretty much every school with unique vintage logos for all of them. And no matter what you buy, you know it'll be comfortable and the colors will last through many washings. Plus, you're supporting an Indiana-based company that came up through the Kelly School of Business. And what could be better than that? Uh, I will say for those who are cheering on Michael Penix and the Washington Huskies, as I am, uh, the Washington hoodie that I ordered before Christmas is one, super comfortable, and two, appeared to be quite lucky, uh, even though they attempted and did their best to uh, give the, the semifinal game away there toward the end. Uh, so definitely we'll be wearing that again as they take on Michigan uh, in a clash of, you know, two traditional Big Ten powers uh, meeting up in the uh, in the national championship game on Monday night. So lots of great stuff to be had at Home Field Apparel. Uh, I know I probably could uh, pick a different school that I own something from and talk about that from now until probably the end of the year uh, as we get through each of these shows. But uh, lots of great stuff, both IU and otherwise. Uh, and so if you go to homefieldapparel.com and use our promo code HOME23, you can get 15% off your first order. Again, that's pro, promo code HOME23 for 15% off your first order. Uh, we're trying, Coach and I are really trying hard to get him to be like your first order of the year or your first order of the month or the week. Week. Um, but yeah. as of now, it's just your first order, period. So just understand that as you go there. But uh, again, you can go to the website, homefieldapparel.com, wear one for the team. All right, so who's your headlines? Uh, two quick ones before we get to the uh, IU Ohio State preview. One, OG Ananobi traded to the Knicks. Uh, and two, Trace Jackson Davis has worked his way into the starting lineup for Golden State, uh, is, is starting playing meaningful minutes for them. You know, Ryan, I'll kind of throw this to you first because I, I know that you follow the NBA more closely than I do. I don't know if you follow it more closely than the coach does, but uh, it won't take much to beat me on this one. But, uh, you know, quick thoughts on the OG trade and, and kind of how he fits in uh, with the Knicks. I think it fits both teams uh, pretty well, actually. R.J. Barrett gets to go home. I mean, Canada for him. But, you know, Ananobi was the centerpiece of the trade. I think that just his versatility and upside is something, and his defensive prowess is something the Knicks sorely needed. R.J. Barrett had kind of, I mean, he was a very inefficient player and had kind of hit his ceiling there. Manuel quickly getting traded. I, I'm surprised they traded that much for O.G., honestly, um, just because they're two valuable guys who could score. Um, but OG is a guy who I think in New York will do really well. He never lets anything get to him. The, the spotlight, the media, nothing like he's very calm. And, and I think he's got the personality for New York, um, in the way that I think there are two personalities that work. You're either Derek Jeter and charming as hell, or you just don't care. And, and, and anywhere in the middle is rough, but if you're on one of those extremes, I think you'll do well. And OG certainly does not play up for the media spotlight. Um, I, I, I think that it's a good fit, and I think it's good for OG. He'll get some attention. Uh, people will start realizing how good he is, and I think that his offensive game will continue to improve. And so I, I really think that's a solid trade for both teams, and, and I think it's a good fit for OG. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about the IU Ohio State game. So it's uh, Saturday night, 8 p.m. Eastern tip. Uh, I believe, Coach, you will be there uh, covering the game. Yep. Um, so yeah, as, as we look ahead for those who haven't watched, uh, too much Ohio state, and I, I would probably put myself in that category. I've watched pieces of a couple games. Uh, they come in at 12 and two, they're two and one in the league, uh, with their, their only big 10 loss coming by three on the road at Penn state, which was a, a bit of a surprise. Uh, their other loss came at home in the second game of the season at Texas A&M who, who's really good. Um, and outside of that, their biggest wins, they did beat Alabama on a neutral floor right around Thanksgiving. Uh, in a really good game, 192 to 81. So won fairly comfortably uh, in that game. They beat UCLA on a neutral court as well, though they're struggling quite a bit. Uh, and then their other two Big Ten wins both came at home against Minnesota and Rutgers. Uh, Minnesota they beat by 10. Rutgers they beat by four. Um, so record wise, they look pretty good. Um, they just went to had to go to overtime to beat West Virginia uh, on a neutral court. West Virginia having a pretty down season so far. So you know I think some reasons to believe despite you know, them sitting at 31 in Ken Palm versus where IU is, as Ryan mentioned earlier, uh, their offensive numbers are 23rd. As I look at this right now, 55th, uh, in, 23rd on offense, 55th on defense. 
Um, you know, a couple numbers that stand out to me, coach, you know, one on the offensive side, they shoot 37.9% from three, which is 26 in the country probably has all IU fans terrified. Uh, I guess I give two on offense. They're also a really good offensive rebounding team. Uh, so those are two things that at times, uh, and, and some, at some points we'd say constantly, uh, that IU has struggled with and then on the defensive end, uh, they've been really good at, at limiting two point shooting. They're 66th in two point defense. As I look at this, obviously as games are being played this evening. Uh, that can change. I think that comes in part from Zed Key and uh, Felix Okpara, who are both pretty good shot blockers um, and and rim protectors there. Uh, you know, so coach, either you know whether you want to jump off one of those numbers and maybe how IU can overcome those trends, or, or if any other numbers stand out to you as you look at the matchup. Well, I, I think you know you're going to have to overcome some of their strengths uh, and and make sure our strengths outbeat their strengths, especially at the two point line. Um, you know that's where our bread and butter is, whether whether we like it or not. Uh, and you know, Ware had twenty last night, uh, I, but he's got to dominate. Renew's got to be able to score inside. A lot of his stuff came outside. Uh, I think we need to, uh, in order to win, we need to be efficient there uh, against their good two point defense. Uh, on the other end, I, you, you are concerned about the three point shooting. Uh, I know this uh, is probably not a. a, a, a Maybe it's a hot take, but I thought in the first half, Indiana guarded the three rather well. Uh, Nebraska hit a couple contested threes, and they got a kick out three, a couple kick out threes on offensive rebounds. So the numbers you brought up that concern, we got to find a way to keep guarding the three, and we got to block out and finish possessions. Uh, Indiana gave up transition points, turnover points, and offensive rebound points in the first half to get down eight, and it set the tone for the second half. Those are finishing defensive possessions. I actually thought the half court first shot defense was acceptable in the first half. I thought as the game kind of went on, the, the whole team kind of let down uh, and their execution of everything kind of fell flat last night. So if you are facing a good three point shooting team, it would be interesting to see coach Woodson was a lot tighter to shooters than he normally was in the nail slot rim stuff. He, he stuck with shooters and I, I thought that worked for a half, uh, but they can't just stick tight to shooters and not finish plays. Uh, and then you can't guard turnovers on the other end. So what they're strong at, uh, Indiana's got to make sure we prevent that. Uh, I know it's just uh, Mr. Obvious there, but we've got to also, against good physical teams with big centers, we've got to be able to dominate in there just because right now that's where that's where Indiana is is more successful. Yeah, I think as you look from a personnel standpoint, uh, you know, individually – They've got a couple sophomores who are, are leading their team in scoring. Bruce Thornton, uh, point guard, uh, leads the team 17.4 points per game. Roddy Gale, uh, also a sophomore at almost 15 points a game. Uh, he does a little bit of everything, and he, he really came on strong in the Big Ten tournament last year and toward the end of the season, and he's really followed that up by playing well uh, to start this year. And the other guy who plays – yeah, they really, if you look at their minutes distribution, I think this speaks to you know the way they've they've beaten uh, some teams pretty soundly. Uh, they've been able to to get other guys involved, but they've got three guys that average over 30 minutes a game. Jamison Battle, the Minnesota transfer being the third, and then the next closest guy plays about 21 minutes a game. So there's um, you know, a bit of a drop off. I think you'll see that that minutes, yeah, you know, I don't think it'll be that balanced in, in what you'd expect to be a close game. Uh, and, and battle is a guy who's given IU plenty of problems in his time yeah. in Minnesota. And you've uh, seen the again, numbers, right? He's probably 45. Yeah. He's at yeah. 45% from three <laughs> this year. Yeah. That is, uh, obviously a, a reason for, uh, for some concern. I think if, for, you know, as an IU fan, uh, as you look at some of that. So, yeah, I think you know, those are some of the individual guys to really look out for. And then, you know, kind of the two headed monster in the post with key and Akpara, uh, I think those guys pretty much combined to play 40 minutes. So they're just basically splitting the, the center position there uh, as you look at it that way. But, you know, I, I do think, you know, they've not played, they've played one true road game and lost it. Uh, IU, this feels like the kind of big, big home and home game that they're going to get up for, especially on the heels of a, a disappointing performance in a, a spot where they really need a win. So Ryan, as you look at some of those, you know, extra factors that may not show up on stats and different things like that. You know, what's your, what's your gut feel on, on what people can expect uh, when, when things tip off on Saturday evening? Well, I think that the key matchup is going to be Ware versus Akpara down low. Uh, I mean, he's a 6'11", 235 pound center who's going to be physical. 
with with where and if where doesn't answer that challenge and plays i mean against nebraska he had 10 guys around him it felt at all times i mean i, I know that's illegal and it didn't happen but you know it felt that way and instead of trying to go you know with power moves and things like that he just tried to shoot the ball over his defender well a par 611 so he's not going to get that you know he's 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 it's going to be tougher to do that he's going to have to sort of muscle his way to baskets um He's Akbar is also going to be bigger than Renew, and so when Renew's in the post and 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 gets the gets draws him, what's he going to be able to do? Uh, this team, I mean, for better or worse, this team plays through the post and is going to win through the post uh, in this system. And so that's the first question you have to ask: is what are they going up against? You're going to give up threes. That's what this team does. And so whether they and it's just on Ohio State to make them. Essentially, they're going to get open looks. Uh, Indiana, I would also say, has been shooting the three well lately, and I would say they should probably shoot 20 of them on Saturday and, you know, come what may, plan to shoot shots. Um, as far as I can tell from this game, I it all depends on Indiana, how Indiana comes out. O Ohio State and Chris Holtman plays pretty much the same everywhere. They don't get too high. They don't get too low. They kind of just play. They go on runs and things like that, but they're pretty just steady. It's going to depend if Indiana comes out ready to play. If Indiana's prepared for the game, if they're ready to go, and if they can get off to a good start, if they don't get off to a good start, you're climbing. Uh, pretty much, they always have to get off to a good start because if you dig yourself a hole, it's very difficult for a team with the flaws Indiana has to make a significant comeback. So they got to come out hard, and they got to come out fast, and they got to start well. Um, and then I think they've got to try and hope they get something from the bench. Because the better games they've played this year, the bench has played well. Yeah, Coach, real quick before we um, kind of dive into the mailbag, you know, is there a matchup or in particular that you're looking for as you uh, as you look ahead to the game? No, I, I I just think Indiana has to be concerned with Indiana. Obviously, you're going to go into scouting reports. Yep. And you're going to know all that stuff, right? And, and there are going to be matchups, but. Indiana individually and collectively has to has to raise their level of, of attention to detail, decision making, and, and and game playing in order to win. Uh, you have seen a couple times recently where you know 20, 25 assists, driving, taking two, and then you go on the road and it was driving into traffic. Uh, not uh, you know some of that's North or, or Nebraska defense. I thought they were very effective in in trapping the post. They didn't trap early. Uh, so the post thought they could dribble, and so they would go on the dribble or even the second bounce to go trap, and then, you know, it was it was a, a little too deep. So you got to take care of the basketball. Uh, and and if you want to be positive, here's the positive uh, light for Saturday: X can't play any worse, uh, and he's going to get his legs back. He just can't. Uh, X is a better player, whether you're happy with him or not, or think he's the answer or not. He's not going to play that bad. Uh, every game. Trey's not going to play that bad every game. And, and so sometimes programs have those games where everything's just crap. Uh, and, and and if you're positive, that's where the hope for Saturday and the, the year, the rest of the year is it was a collectively bad result against a halfway decent team. It's not good, um, but hopefully they get back. You know, there's a comment, uh, Forrest makes a comment in the chat. You know, I don't know if you can expect X to be back to where we need him to by Saturday. But he he should be even a little bit better uh, than what he was uh, against Nebraska. But it's little things for me, guys. It, we continue to not to block out, and if if we don't get beat on second chance points, we give up opportun you know opportunistic second chance points where they get a run or they get some momentum going. Uh, same with transition. Our transition defense is okay, but it always seems, you know, when we need to make a run, all of a sudden, boom, boom, there's five points in transition. We don't cover a three-point shooter in transition, and now it's nine, and now you got an uphill battle against these good teams. So close out possessions defensively. Uh, we're not good defensively right now, but when you do play well, finish them. And then when you go down on the other end, help your defense out by not turning the dang ball over. So Indiana – Yes, you have to worry about what Ohio State brings, but they have to worry about getting better themselves. That's the concern for those of us who are a little negative is we have not seen that, and we're at the halfway mark after Saturday. Uh, 15, 16 games, halfway mark, including the, count, the, the conference tournament. So take care of your game. Individually play well. Do your job. 
share the basketball. Those are things that we've liked the offense when it's clicked. Those are the things that have worked. Do more of that and less of the stuff that doesn't work. And it's simple. It's Mr. Obvious stuff. But Indiana has not shown that toughness uh, to do the fundamental things that win basketball games. Yeah, I think the couple matchup things that I I look at, I don't. I, I think Galloway is a decent matchup for Roddy Gale, who's a little bit bigger, a little more physical, six four, uh, bigger guy. I think that is not a terrible matchup from for Galloway from a defensive standpoint. And then the other one is really Malik Renew and trying to figure out what Ohio State wants to do with him. Battle for all the things that he's good at on the offensive end is not a good defender. Uh, they've been playing him at the four. Can you afford? can you afford to really put him on renew, give up a bunch of points? And and so the spacing becomes important Do they put where and more of a high post scenario or something like that. So I think that's really the big one is trying to figure out how they, how they try to deal with renew. Uh, if he's not doubled, he should be able to, to, to have a field day. If he is uh, other guys have to step up and knock that shot. So those are a few things to look for. I, I do think it's a game, maybe some assembly hall magic uh, in, in place. And uh yeah. And now you can get a big win and and kind of turn things back in a good direction. So we'll see what happens on Saturday. And obviously uh, some subset of us will be here to talk about it uh, after the game. And, and Coach will be there on site. So uh, with that, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll uh, dive into the first part of our mailbag. And uh, this one more on the coaching and scheme component of things. And so that will be up next here uh, on the Assembly Call. I can faintly hear the music, but. Who knows? Oh, well. I'm done. We're not blaming you, Coach. I say we just scrap it. Technology sucks. <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh, All right. Quick, we're going to play the guitar. It's, <laughs> it's operator error. I, I tried to do the right thing and update. And ever since I've updated, the settings are all, I can't get a handle on the it's settings. Still I running. apologize. Music's yeah. still running. I do still hear it now in the back. Can you yeah. hear it? Yeah. It's like very uh, I mean, low. Very, very it's, it's going in and out. Yeah. It's uh is the kind of thing where if you turn your microphone off, it comes in clear, maybe or something? I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't worry. About it. We'll test all, it afterwards. You, you can test it afterwards. Yeah, you heard all those sayings, those funny clips I had before the show. I thought everything was good. Yeah. Once and you then, hit record, it changed. Yeah. Yeah. Once. Yeah, oh well. So, well, this is our yeah. break, everybody. That, Hi. <laughs> yeah. Oh anyway. man. Oh, well. Really, Just, really okay. good questions coming up. I think. Yeah. I Let's agree. just dive right in. Let's do it. Might as well dive right in. Um, I guess I can pretend that we have intro music and and uh, so Ryan can out. sing. I, I no, heard, you know, that's another, that's you don't want sing that. karaoke. You, you don't want that. Trust me, sure. nobody wants that. I'm not sure. I mean, we've had a rough week already. I don't think. Yeah, we need you to don't. probably go down that road. I don't have auto tune on this mic, so. Oh no, well, it's... I mean, if you did though, then it'd be totally different. <laughs> <laughs> Would make a world of difference. All right, sounds good. All right. Well, welcome back to the assembly call. I'm Andy Bottoms. I'm here with the coach, Brian Tonsoni and Ryan Phillips, and we're going to uh, dive into the mailbag. Uh, I, I would say there was some uh, desire to do this to, to basically not rehash a lot of the things that happened uh, in the game against Nebraska. Although uh, most of these uh, questions are probably on some level picking at those wounds anyway. So we'll kind of, we'll, we'll probably do it uh, indirectly here, but the way I split these up was try to try to fit some coaching and scheme ones together. So we'll hit those here. Uh, then we'll do a few player related ones and then a couple big picture things at the end, including one uh, about uh, Baylor's new stadium and what that might mean for uh, Assembly Hall, which I'm sure Ryan will have some uh, some opinions on. But first question comes from Sean says specifically this is for Coach Tonsoni. Uh, we'll see if Ryan and I have anything to uh, to add to this. But he said Mike Woodson calls and asks for your help for this week only. Uh, all of the other assistants have emergency meetings with five stars that are planning to commit next year. What are two things that are reasonable to accomplish between now and the Ohio State game that you're going to put in the game plan or in practice to win this weekend? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I would suggest to Coach Woodson, and some of the stuff I just got done saying there at the at the end of, of segment one, uh, you know, run through some practice, whether you do live practice or not. When you only have two days in between games, sometimes you go live, sometimes you don't. You drill, you break break down stuff. But I would really emphasize uh, moving that basketball and trying to put Indiana in a lot of different scenarios of when they double in the post. Do they double early? Do they double late? Do they double from the strong side? And I know he, he t teaches that. Every coach teaches that. But I would really emphasize that because in, in the last two games – 
uh, when we saw Indiana's offense really, really click, they shared the basketball. And so we got away from it at Northwestern. We had high turnovers. We had a decent amount of uh, assists. Uh, but that really, it wasn't meaningful uh, because the game was was out of hand by the time some of those assists were created. But I would really do a lot of drilling, a lot of breakdown on making sure you're taking good shots. And when you draw traffic in the lane, you kick it out. Caleb Banks, Anthony Walker, even renewed at some point, try to go through two or three people way too much in Mike Woodson's scheme. I don't think you can change schemes that quick uh, in, in two days. Uh, th- that has to be something you put in little by a little by little and have a a target date if you really want to change up some things. You might add a set or two uh, that you think would really be effective against uh, what Ohio State does defensively. But right now, the way Mike Woodson runs offense, I would suggest him just making sure that fundamentally take care of the basketball and share the basketball. That'll get us more threes uh, because uh, of the double teams and the actions that X will draw uh, off of ball screen actions. And when we do that, and I, I would also encourage shooters to be ready to catch and shoot instead of flat-footed on their catches. So I guess the thing that I would do is two fundamental things. Uh, in two days, try to try to improve your fundamentals, and then you, you're going to have to really uh, find a mental aspect. You know, film uh, a lot of talking to these guys because they were mentally not with it, or or when it goes bad, it really goes bad for this team. Uh, and so I think quickly, Sean, those those would be a couple things uh, that I, that I would put in. I think it's more about what coach emphasizes these next two days in order to beat Ohio State rather than. Um, a whole lot of drills or schemes or plays. You got to get better at the fundamentals of what you are currently doing if you're going to have any chance Saturday against Ohio State. Yeah, I think two two quick things here, and then uh, Ryan, I'll throw the next question to you. One is kind of a joke, but um, find ways to hit the ball off of people so that you set up baseline out of bounds plays. That appears to be when I use it its best. If the whole I, fantastic, offense, it's like yeah. What if you just built the whole offense out of the baseline out of bounds plays? You know, it's like building the whole plane out of the out black, of, box. Of black yeah, box. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the non-joking one is some coach and I talked about briefly before we got started, and it, some of the defensive things. You know, there, there was a change uh, last night where they're really trying to chase shooters. One thing they continue to struggle with though is switching. Uh, and I don't know if they're changing what they're trying to do over the course of the game or at different points in possessions or different things like that, but it it leads to a ton of confusion. So to me, the answer there is simplify. If, if your guys just aren't good enough to play defensively, then let's find that out. I think what the, the struggle is, I'm not sure that people are as bad defensively indiv- on an individual basis as it makes it seem when there's – a handful of possessions, probably more than a handful of possessions each game where they're scrambling because, you know, they've switched and aren't sure, you know, who's on who, or they go and close out to a non-shooter and leave a shooter open. Cause both guys get, you know, yesterday the, the Alec guy is in the corner. If that guy wants to shoot a corner three, let him, let but him. two guys go to him. He kicks it over on one pass to a guy in the wing who is a shooter and makes it, but it's just, what can you do to simplify it defensively so there's less of those confusions and, and those kind of breakdowns there? Uh, all right, Ryan, next one is uh, I'll throw to you from James. What is Mike Woodson's stated offensive scheme slash philosophy? I know this is a this is a powder keg of a question here. Uh, we all know what we've seen on the court, but what does he say he wants to do and what successful college team, if any, runs that type of offense? Well, we were told that he they wanted to spread it out and change the offense this year with Trace Jackson Davis gone, and that has not happened. It's basically the same system. Um, they run the high-low a little bit more, uh, I think, because Race Thompson was so in and out of the lineup. At times, it was harder for them to do that. Uh, they run the high-low with uh, you know the double post with with Renew and, and Wear a lot. Um, I think what Mike Woodson wants to do is get his players isolated one-on-one, whether it's in the post or on the perimeter and basically have them beat their man one-on-one. Um, there's very little in this, in the offense that is setting somebody up for an open look or drive. It's more, can you beat the guy across from you? And in his recruiting philosophy that plays out. He's not getting guys who, I mean, he gets, he gets good basketball players. So, so don't take this the wrong way, but he's passing on guys who are very good fundamental players to go for athletes and to go for high end players. And and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does tell on the philosophy, what you need to do. And, and I think I'm going to, I know you asked about 
offense, but I'm going to transition to defense a little bit here. In the NBA, you can run the system he runs, the nail slot run system with all the switching and all the movement and all the help. And because NBA guys are bigger, faster, stronger, quicker, and they can help and recover in a way that college kids, as we've seen so far, aren't really adept at and aren't really good at. And, you know, there's the NBA is a completely different animal. Guys think about basketball 24 hours a day. College basketball players, well, I know people are going to say, well, you're getting paid with NIL. You need to do better. Well, they have limited practice time. I mean, the NCAA has rules about practice time and workout time and all of that stuff. So it's just different and it takes longer to teach them something new. And so I, I do think offensively, this team, Wants to play through the post. Mike Woodson has repeatedly stated publicly he doesn't really care about the three-point line. We don't make that up. I mean, he said, you know, last year Miller Cop was shooting 47% from three at one point during the season. And they said, why isn't he shooting more? He said, it's not my job to get Miller Cop shots. And the implication being, we've got Trace Jackson Davis. We're going to get him shots and, and Jalen Huchifino or whatever. And yeah, those are your two best players. Get him shots. But also getting your three-point shooter going makes life easier on those other guys because their burden isn't as strong and it spaces the floor for them. And so I just don't think there is much of an investment in the value of the three point line. We have not seen a concerted effort to get shooter shots. We've not seen a concerted effort to run shooters off of screens and pin downs and things like that. You see it occasionally uh, and occasionally it works and then they just don't go back to it. I don't know why. Um, so that's what he's running. And, and if you look at the offense, it looks a lot like what he ran with the Hawks from 2004 on. And a lot like he ran with, with the Knicks for two years, 2014, 2012, 2014. And at the end with the Knicks, the NBA had passed on that kind of offense and was playing a different way. And Mike Woodson has not adjusted to the way modern basketball is played, where there's a heavy emphasis on shooting. And yeah, if you have an advantage in the post, you play through the post as well, run pick and roll, do that to get your, to get your big guy moving, get the defenders moving. But he doesn't embrace the three-point line. And... I don't know why. It's very obvious it's out there. If you read one analytics book, it would tell you, you need to invest in this. And Indiana doesn't. And so I don't know why. Again, I've said that like 12 times, but this just seems to be the way his system is run. And the goals of his system are different than the goals of pretty much every other team that I've watched this year, at least in college basketball. So I don't think anybody else runs the system. Um, maybe somebody does and we don't hear about them, but that's not a great uh, endorsement either. Ryan, defensively, I, I've tried to – I don't watch the pro game a lot with the bracketology stuff. I, I got college games going like crazy over here. But I've tried really hard to watch and see. Um, and I don't I don't see a lot of that even I don't think in they do it anymore. NBA. Yeah. Uh, a few teams have done it occasionally. But I do think Coach Woodson's defense, his emphasis, what he's trying to do is be ball-centered. React to the pass, R watch the ball and where the ball goes, then you've got to react defensively instead of knowing where cutters are. Sh and, and, and the college game has a lot more movement than the NBA yep. game. So watch when Purdue's you are ball centered, yeah, when you're ball centered Purdue's in the NBA, sometime. they move constantly. Yeah, you can, you can stare at the ball with your back to a, uh, a shooter. And when that ball goes over your head, you're, you're likely to know where that shooter is going to yeah. be. And if you watch enough NBA guys, you'll see every once in a while, they'll, they'll dive or back cut that, that I, what I call out of position defense. But in the NBA, they'd almost rather you do that and score two and go down because the NBA plays defense, but they want to play defense to get to 110 because you're scoring 120. It's just, yeah. it's a different game, Wildly but it's different. ball centered. When, when the ball goes into the post, everyone turns and looks. When the ball's at the top of the key, there was a picture I shared in our with, with all of our staff where two guys were on the elbow and one guy was at the nail. Three guys were guarding one ball handler. Um, it is so ball-centric. That's what he believes in, and that's what uh, he he's teaching. And that's why Cups got beat last night on the back door when they showed that on, on the replay. He was in the corner. His head was turned towards the ball because he's been taught for four months to watch the ball and, and it was then they a went to very a simple man. cut you know very yeah. simple back cut and the guy just back cut from the corner um but because they've been taught for four years to do the nail slot or four months nail slot rim watch the ball react to the ball and then last night they adjusted to stay with your men and it's hard to change in two or three days per scouting report when you have been so drilled trey galloway is a coach's kid in the state of indiana 
Uh, I'm sure that when the ball goes down the post, he doesn't turn his butt to the midcourt line and watch the low post and try to react. It, that is totally NBA basketball on the defensive side. Uh, so they're running what Coach Woodson wants them to run. I don't know that they're executing it well because of the things you said about the the athleticism, the size, the quickness. And then the question is, is there ever going to be more than just a one-game adjustment to, to three-point shooters? Is there going to be some fundamental in stances and, and reaction and how you, how you guard certain actions? We'll have to see. But that's one way Indiana can get better. Well, you have to look at, too, when Mike Woodson was a head coach in the NBA starting in 2004. Back then, it was a lot of superstars being the only guy on their team, you know, Kobe Bryant with the Lakers. Now he had Shaq and he had Pau Gasol and whatever, but like every time Kobe drove, all you cared about was stopping him from scoring. You don't care about the guys on the wings because nobody shot threes back then, you know? So it's all about stopping the guy with the ball. And it was always going to be the best player with the ball unless the team ran one set every once in a while, but it's a lot of the NBA for most of the game is a lot of one-on-one -on -one basketball. It's just the way it is. And then the last five, 10 minutes, you start running offense, you start guarding differently and you know, you, you clamp down on yeah. switches and things like that. But when Mike Woodson was a head coach, it was a different league and it was all and based he, on individuals, you know? And so you got, go ahead. Defensive rules that you don't have in college too, yep. where you got to spread out and you can't be mm -hmm. in the lane. You can only be in the lane for two seconds. You got defensive yep. three seconds. So that's where the nail becomes important. Because yeah. if someone gets the nail in the NBA, they're going all the way to the rim for a monster dunk more than likely because your rim protection is is pulled out. A hundred percent. And that's why and it's, it's a good not, defense for that if you want to stick a guy there. Uh, but if you the want, college game's different. If, if you want to stop one perimeter player, the nail slot rim makes sense. It does. Yeah. But the thing is, is that teams are more balanced now and – have you know it's not one guy scoring 40 and everybody unless it's Zach Eady and everybody else scoring eight you know it's it, it's a balance attack with your driver your point guard your shooter your post guy and it, it is kind of confused that everything is focused on the ball well the most yeah. dangerous guy on the floor is the guy with the ball but the guy standing wide open on the wing is just as dangerous if not more so sometimes because if that guy's a shooter and he knocks down that three. That's better than the two you were going to give up down the lane. So I'm not saying don't guard the lane. It's just, I don't know. It, you know, it's a different philosophy. It's a different philosophy than I was raised on. I was raised on, as Rick Jarrell has pointed out here, ball you man and, you know, help regular help defense. Um, so it's different. I think that's why there's an adjustment period every year. It seems like the team struggles to begin the season with it. Um, this team's continued to struggle with it. And, I, you know, at some point, I mean, I think Indiana's look better playing zone than they have playing man. In the in the small stretches they've played zone, I think they've looked better than doing the nail slot rim. And I hate watching zone defense, but <laughs> honestly, with this team's length and athleticism, maybe you go to it. I I don't know. All right. Moving on to the next one. Uh this is from Caleb, said mainly for coach slash coaches. Uh, I, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but his general, I think the first part sums it up well. Am I the only one that's noticed how this offense runs things just to run them, but almost not to score? Uh, Coach, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I feel like I've noticed the same yeah. thing where there's there's actions that people are doing, but nobody's Jogging really like cuts. hard enough in a way that it actually puts pressure on the defense that you're robotically going to the places that you're supposed to go and running the set. But in a lot of cases, outside of the the, out, the baseline out of bounds stuff, the motions aren't aggressive enough or quick enough to put the pressure on the defense that you'd want to with those actions. Is that just, uh, are you seeing the same thing or, or how do you, the action, kind of the actions are designed to get one-on-one -on -one matchups. It's not designed to do what you're asking it to do, to be aggressive. It is when you weave, you hope someone switches and when they switch, now you can In take an match. advantage to drive. Um, that that's just a philosophy and, and it's not bad. Um, there are times when you have a bad defender and if that team is switching, you want to switch that bad defender on your best player. And then you want to attack one-on-one uh, -on -one basketball, but almost all of what Indiana's actions are doing is to open up someone in the post. And really that's a lot of offense. A lot of offense is not, you're not going to score directly out of a play. A lot of times, unless you get a back cut at the rim, a pass and a layup, what you're doing in, in offense is trying to move the defense 
uh, and get your players to make scoring uh, into scoring opportunities. But Coach Woodson really likes the ISO game with the ball screen, and he really likes the post ISO and to play off of that. So when they double team the post, that's when they're going to shoot the three. When they trap a ball screen, that's when they're going to hit the short roll and be able to go inside. So he is just he just believes in creating matchups. And, and as a philosophy, I, I, I like that. I don't mind that. For me, it's the lack of creativity with that. Go ahead and every team throws it in the post and stands. Everyone throws it in the post and dives a guy. Everyone runs middle ball screen. But they have a lot of other actions at times when those other actions are needed. And that's where I think Indiana gets stuck in three or four things to get those ISO plays. Yeah, I, I think one, t- one thing that, that – that riles me up when I watch the team play is, you know, things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, when they're getting into the offense, the wing screening down for the post, they never contact the defender. It's just kind of, it's almost just like an exchange, not a screen. And they just kind of jog by each other. And it's because that's not important to the play they're running, you know, that cause you're going to get the movement anyway, but stuff like that, I mean, can create advantages. If you get a, if you get, uh, you know, if you actually set the screen there, the defense might get confused on a switch. Both go out to the perimeter. You got a wide open guy out of the post, or they might get confused. Both switch to the big man. You got a wide open player on the on on the corner. But you just see Indiana kind of jog through them, and it's clear that's not the emphasis to get an opening off that screen. It's more just exchanging movement, like you said, to hope for a switch or something like that, where you can then get the ISO you need, and screening hard and cutting hard. I'm not saying it's a lack of effort. I'm saying this is part of the system to, to you know, it's yeah. not drilled into them that this is important, I think. And if it is, it's not translating because you watch it. Yeah. I mean, I watched Malik Renu and Mackenzie and Baco exchange places about six times yesterday where they were supposed to be screens for each other. And it's just, they just walk right. They just basically jog by each other. And it's, I, I, you know, that kind of stuff is, you're right. It's in, it's, it's drilled into the system because that screen's not important to what you're trying to do. Therefore, we're going to emphasize something else. And yeah. and there's watch, a lot of again, programs, Ryan, that don't believe in screening anymore. I know it, it hurts spacing. I know, and also four, it, four people together in a spot, course. and a, and some some of the theory it's kind of come and gone. But I still like to watch programs that run good screens, and then it ends up in spacing because you've run those screens exactly. And, 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 and to me, it's more of a variety of actions. Some screens, some isolation plays, some posts, some, some little weave. ball screens. Yeah. No, um, and, and, and one, yeah. Thing, one thing about that, Coach, because you're, you're right. And also, you know, guys aren't, as, for some reason, aren't as good as, at screening as they used to be. And so right. you get offensive fouls and things like that. You leave yourself open to that in turnovers because of the lack of screening in the game. But you're right. It's just that it never happens. You know, it's a once in a yeah. while thing where maybe if you're doing that exchange thing, you've kind of lulled the defense into a sense of security and you do an ups, you know, you do, you do a back screen and, and send your wing guy to the post. I mean, like, you know, sucker him in and run something else, but it's not. It's the same all the time. And it's yeah. all based on getting a switch and getting an ISO and then yeah. driving a guy or getting the post up or whatever. And it's just it. And here's the thing. I would not care if it worked. It just, we have very little evidence that it's working consistently for Indiana. And right. the times that it did work, you had Trace Jackson Davis, who is starting in the NBA right now and was a four year guy. And you had a lottery pick running point. Those are the times it worked. And then the stretch where Xavier Johnson and Trace played out of their minds at the end of the first of Woodson's first season and got him into the tournament. So when we complain about the offense, I don't care what system they run as long as it works, but this is consistently not working. Well, and what's, what's interesting to me about it is you see, you know, I'll kind of take that, you know, kind of elbow handoff that they've run a billion times this year. I forget which game it was. It might've been Kansas. I don't know. You know, they ran a really good variation of that where you saw the defense start to, to guard it a certain way and they ran a counter to it and it was effective. And I think that's, I think sometimes at least where I get frustrated is is that there can be ways to scheme things to work within this to keep the defense off guard um, because what you see and you didn't really see that a lot last night. I mean, last night, Nebraska was just basically blitzing Galloway every time they tried to run that and he had no place to go. He couldn't really turn either direction. All he could do was pass the ball or dribble the ball back out. They hard hedged on everything and they couldn't really get anything there. And so it's like but you've seen other times where 
they've made adjustments to how defenses are playing and they've been effective at that. But then last night, it just seemed like they went away from that and abandoned it. And when things got tight, it all turned into one-on-one plays, which is really without any structure to get there. Just, all right, we need a shot. I'm going to, I'm going to be the guy to go try to take it and make it. And so, you know, I think some of that, at least from my perspective is what's uh, a little bit of the frustration. Uh, Last one on the coaching section uh, from Michael after last night, and honestly, the season's offensive and defensive failures. Do you see any major changes coming? I've seen small tweaks here and there. It seems obvious what they're doing isn't working uh, with this roster. Uh, I- I'll kind of take this one quickly. I-, I think you're too far into the season to really see any kind of major change. So that's really the point of the, you know, I guess the 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 word that was used in the question. Um, th- to Coach's point, you've drilled one thing in for four months to the new guys, for a year and four months to the other guys. Uh, or longer and so you're already seeing as they're trying to make even slight tweaks defensively those habits that you've built up over that time are going to take time to to back away from so i don't think you can really do major things that doesn't mean continue slamming your head into the wall to try to run what you're running now either um so i think you'll continue to see some of those slight tweaks uh and efforts to to change up some things particularly on the defensive end um but I don't think you're going to see any kind of major schematic changes. They're not going to become a team that plays zone all the time. They're not going to become uh, a team that really runs dramatically different stuff offensively. I think you'll continue to see uh, more of the small changes that uh, that you've seen so far. Um, well, because we don't have music, we're just going to transition right into the next segment. Um, but a reminder that these uh, mailbag questions uh, were submitted via our private IU basketball discussion community on Substack, which you can learn more about at assemblycall.com. Uh, all right. So these guys, I've got these more player related, uh, questions here. So this one, uh, from Julie, Ryan, I'll throw this to you first. What leadership moves would you suggest to X and Trey as the team captains? I think that their leadership, I'm sure they're vocal and all of those things behind the scenes. I'm not going to question that, but they need to be consistent game to game and, and lead by example. And we have not seen that with either one of them in their careers. Generally, I mean, the efforts there from Trey, but he makes a lot of mistakes and some games he just disappears offensively. Uh, X has been, has looked like an all big 10 guard at times and has looked like he should be one of the last players off the bench at others because not because he's not skilled enough, but because he throws the ball all over the gym. He's not focused. He is focused on arguing with the refs and not guarding. I mean, like, you know, it's, We've seen that from him consistently for three years now. And those two guys need to lead by example. Trace Jackson Davis led by example. Race Thompson led with his effort. Uh, Jalen Huchifino, you'd follow that guy because you know how damn good he is. And he, and he all, you know, he had, he had his bad games as a freshman, but you always felt comfortable with the ball in his hands. Those guys need to lead by example. That's, that's what I would suggest. And quite frankly, a guy who has done, that when he's been in the game and he is limited physically and uh, you can say everything about him getting minutes and, you know, he shouldn't be getting that many minutes because of X, Y, Z. Anthony Leal comes in and plays really damn hard and doesn't screw up. Um, you know, he missed a guy on defense yesterday, gave up an open look, um, you know, and he, he contested it late guy hit the three. Um, but he comes in and he's where he's supposed to be and he does what he's supposed to do. Those guys need to do that too. And I know it's small sample size for Leal, so don't get on me about that. But, you know, the, that that's what I would say is lead by example. You know, find your consistency and the rest of the team needs to know what to expect from its leaders every game. Indiana has no idea what it's getting from those guys game to game. And that puts the burden on everybody else. For X, I would say control your controllables. Uh, a lot of what Ryan said, but I would use that phrase, control your controllables, control your effort, your attitude, your your fundamentals, your work ethic. Are you working hard? Uh, do all those things and the game will come back to you. For Trey, I've said this all season long, Trey is trying so hard to lead this team and, and he ends up doing three or four players' jobs and then he ends up not doing his job well in certain games. Uh, and, and another word as far as leadership is is relax. I think Trey just needs to relax and, and play play a little more free. And and part of that is when you're trying to tell people where to go all the time and you're trying to cover up this and the switch with Renew last night, he was really covering – Renew shouldn't have switched, but when there was a mistake, then Trey runs back to the post. And 
I just see in a young man that is a smart basketball player that he's trying to do too many roles uh, is, is the impression from afar. Uh, so do your job. Let the other players worry about their job. Let Coach Woodson worry about the others. You have that. I've had that in coaching with guys that really care about the program. You've got to back them off of, of, of trying to do too many jobs. And I've had conversations with kids. Just do your job. Don't worry about the sophomore that you're trying to bring along. Don't worry about someone else. Do your job. So control your controllables for X. Uh, just do your job. Simplify your game, Trey. Have fun. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of joy in, in, in Trey. And I think, uh, again, I read that as he's trying so hard to bring all these new people together as the leader uh, that it's it's costing him sometimes in certain games. Yeah, I think, you know, what I would, would say to that is um... – I think what you need from them is, is a calm and a steadiness from those guys. And I'm not sure that either of those guys game is predicated on those things. Um, right. Which kind of makes it difficult for them, I think, to lead in that way. And and part of that is trying to figure out their own way to lead. But, you know, when X is at his best, he isn't necessarily, you know, calm. He's really pushing the pace. He's really, you know, got, got his foot on the gas and, uh, and trying to do that. So it's kind of hard. I think for to get that from him. And I think, you know, Trey's a guy they called, you know, the crazy man. They, you know, call him last year. Like, you know, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to like that calm and steadiness. But I, uh, I made it, you know, an hour before my first Eagles reference, but there was, they were talking to Fletcher Cox on a podcast I listened to. And, and one of the things he said at some point, I, I'm going to get the, the exact words wrong, but the essential thing was like the calmer I stay, the calmer everybody else stays. Um, if they see me as a leader on the team, panicking or being erratic or whatever that makes everybody else feel that way uh and ratchets that up and i think that's a challenge of these two guys personalities being asked to lead this team i think they're the natural choice to be the leaders of the team based on experience um but i do think it's it, in some ways maybe an odd fit for their personalities and how they they go about things uh all right next one um I'm going to I'm going to not ask this exactly the way it was, but Angela sent in a question about X. And, and so, Coach, I'm going to throw this one to you. you. You know, how did you how do you view the process of bringing a guy back from an injury in, in that way? He, he struggled. Um, is that a case where you wouldn't start him? You try to ease him back in in a different way. Like what what do you feel? You know, we can all say now what happened last night for whatever reason was not an effective way to kind of reintegrate him with the team. Um, I don't know if there's any one reason that that was true. Um, but how do you, how do you kind of deal with that, integrate him back into the team and how do you know when, Hey, this isn't working and how do you handle those kinds of situations with the, with a guy like him? Yeah, I, I tend to want to, uh, play injured P, uh, players back in their role if they're healthy and they practiced well and, and they are determined to be a hundred percent, uh, maybe short, uh, a little bit, just it kind of like Ware was out for a sickness. You knew he was going to be short of breath and everything. Um, and he had much less time off. Uh, the reason you wouldn't start X last night is if you felt that he, he didn't really work hard to get back in shape, he really wasn't there, but he could be all right. Or he had to be uh, on a, on a minute's limit. Uh, and he would have been more effective coming off the bench. I was a little surprised that he, he started because I just felt with the, the foot injury that he would need a little bit time and knowing his up and down play, that it might've been a calming presence to, to see the flow of the game and then go in and calm down because someone like X wants to get in and go 800 miles an hour right away. And he made some nice plays, but he also made a heck of a lot of mistakes and then fouled and did some things. And you could just see his mind start racing as things, the struggle happened. He didn't grow within the game. He kind of decreased within the game. As adversity uh, happened to him, he didn't handle that very well. But normally, I think if I have a starter and especially a captain and they have been deemed by the medical personnel to be okay, I, I would I would normally put them in the starting uh, lineup it didn't work out last night, uh, so maybe he wasn't as basketball ready uh, to, to go back. And if he wasn't basketball ready to go back but you wanted to play him, then maybe the decision should have been to, to bring him off for limited minutes off the bench and get off uh, to a start with the players who have started before. But I have no problem um, with starting injured players in general, um, but maybe it wasn't the right thing last night. Yep. All right, Ryan, next one is for you. Uh, this is from James. We touched on this a little bit on the show uh, last night, which uh, was after you had had dropped. So 
wanted to get your thoughts here. Uh, what type of development should we have expected for CJ and Caleb at this point, and do we think they're going to get it next year? Besides Malik, haven't noticed major physical changes with anybody, and the in-game awareness seems to be the same level as last year. Yeah, I don't know what we should have expected. Honestly, um, we were expecting Gunn to be a better shooter. He's hitting about 30% of his threes. Uh, Banks, we expected sort of more skill development. Haven't really seen that because um, we knew he had energy and athleticism. My my assessment of both those guys is when they come in, they're trying to do a lot as opposed to just play defense, go out there, let the game come to you. You're not a primary scorer, so let the ball find you. Uh, I don't think either player is equipped to be a one-on-one player, an ISO player, which unfortunately is what this offense is. They're complementary players who, you know, CJ Gunn's a guy who should, or I mean, uh, uh, Caleb Banks guy should be back cutting and getting a, getting a, a lob or should be, you know, it, it, you know, rebounding. Off of first, yeah. Rebounding. But like, I'm talking offensively, but like right. on, on offense, like catching a ball off a reversal and shooting the three and, and things like that. They're not guys like CJ Gunn. You'll see him try and hunt his shot when he's got the ball and try. You know, you saw that that long two yesterday. I mean, I'd have put him on the bench immediately when he took that shot. Like, what are you doing? Either take the three or pass it along. You're not a one on one driver. You're not going to beat a guy to the spot and then make a, a smooth jumper. Now, he's hit a couple of those this year. It doesn't make him good shots. Um, and, and, you know, even that, the, you know, things like the free throw line for CJ, he's shooting 63% this year from the free throw line. I, I, I know it's all mental with them. They want to play. They're not playing very much. And they want to, when they get in there, to prove that they deserve to be playing. And so you come in with this ball energy and I'm going to go, go, go. That's not your role. And so maybe their roles aren't defined to them. You know, there's that's a possibility. That's that the not, issue. That it's not clearly communicated to them what they're supposed to be doing. And so they don't know. And so they're playing as if they come in and they're the guy, you know, Banks is going to drive immediately. And he's had success at that, but not game to game, you know, and then guns going to try and pull jumpers and all that. And they're both talented players. And so I think that, you know, unfortunately they should have developed more by now and, and they should be you know thickly in the rotation and being a big part of things. I don't know where the disconnect is. I don't know if it's on the coaching side, the player side, whatever. I'm not in those conversations, but they should be more by now. Those guys have enough skills and talent to be something on this team and be really effective coming off the bench. And they're not, you don't know what you're getting game to game. And I don't know if that's just their fault or if it's a communication issue or it's a development issue. I really don't. Uh, but it is concerning because they both have the talent to be contributors. They're the prototype player you need, the size and strength. Uh, yeah. But are you, are Energy they being too. used in the right? Right. And they have some defensive capabilities. But I said it on last night's show, I think Caleb's more a four. I think Gunn's more a come off a screen, catch and shoot, and have the green light to shoot and be freed up to shoot. But but um, Andy used the term reckless drives. It seems like the emphasis on this team is everyone gets to pound the basketball into the lane and do what you want with it in the lane. And, and hopefully it's a positive when we get fouled. And Caleb Banks had a nice and one when down 68, 64, but how many times do we not pass to open threes? Or we, last night we tried to go, even coach Woodson said we drove into, but coach Woodson, we see it every game. Yeah. That, that seems Walker like the catches system. And he does, he's going to, that seems like the system is gentlemen, drive the basketball, drive the basketball, go make a play, go make a play. You catch, drive that close out, drive that close out. And then I'm wondering where's the counter to that, which is the inner, um, the understanding of what's happening when you're driving, right? And so it looks like this team is drive and shoot. That's the emphasis, not drive and draw to and get someone open. And when they, like I said, when they've done that, it's it's good. But I, that's where Banks and Gun, you're right. They look like they're hunting shots, but I wonder if they're being coached to. And then when they play, play or play. not play in the second half based on their success, they feel like they got to put the ball in the basket. Um or make a stellar defensive play. They got to make an impact when sometimes we've seen it with Leo. You don't have to do basketball things to have a successful run for eight minutes. Leo comes in and maybe does three things basketball wise that you would say were really, really good, but he didn't screw up and he moved the basketball and he was in good position. Sometimes you don't have to, to make plays. You just have to, uh, know be your a role good teammate, and know your role. And so, I think their roles have been defined as slashers and scorers and drivers, all of those guys. 
uh, and not shooters. And so that's when they get in trouble. And then it looks like their development's not there. Uh, the disconnect is in both. I think the players have struggled with their body language and their mental approach, and and you understand why. But I also think the message is a little confusing or hasn't been taught as as well as it possibly can. Or we would see those guys playing better, maybe not at their full potential, but at least better than what they're doing right now. Yeah, I would say I agree with that, Coach. I think that it's completely fair to to think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I saw this from some people on social media yesterday about how like, you know, well, Woodson doesn't, you know, Woodson didn't take that long too. Woodson didn't do this. Woodson didn't do that. It's like when guys are consistently doing the same thing and it's not working, that's coaching too. It's on the coach to either bench that guy or teach him what he should be doing. And so, you know, when, when people do say like, that's, you know, that's not his fault. Well, it's his team. And this is stuff we've seen all year. You know, there's no accountability for that from that level. And, you know, oh, these guys aren't, aren't, you know, they're doing this, they're doing that. It's like, well, it, you paid a lot of money to be the coach in Indiana. Things need to get better. And, and, uh, you know, if you don't have the players you want or, or something to that effect, you've got to make do with what you got and you got to improve the ones you got, you got to develop them and you got to deploy them correctly and make sure they know how they're supposed to be deployed and what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. I think the one thing you see, um, with what you're talking about with these, you know, the drives, like I, you drives for different reasons than other teams drive. It seems to me like if you watch uh, the extreme example of this is Alabama, Alabama is all rim and three. And it is essentially most possessions are a series of driving, kicking it out, attacking the closeout, kicking it back out, attacking another closeout, and just a series of like trying to get to the matchups. And eventually for them, and this is the the coach at Kennesaw State was on staff there for a while and they played very much the same way. Almost every possession ends in a shot at the rim or a three pointer. And but they're driving for the purpose of maybe I'm going to get a basket. But I know that I'm looking to be able to kick the ball out to put somebody else in an advantage of somebody now has to close out on them, and then they're going to drive the basketball. I use not really driving for those reasons in general. Um, they're kind of driving to get fouled, maybe driving to score, but not really with the same flow, I would say, as if you watch some other teams in, in college basketball. Uh, last question in this section. I'll, I'll take this one quickly from Catherine. Uh, apologize if this has already been answered or discussed. Why isn't Anthony Leal – starting more slash getting more playing time. Um, I, I think you guys had a, a good discussion on this in the Kennesaw. I think in the Kennesaw State post game, if I'm remembering correctly, is when that came up. Uh, I, I think I, I like the way Woodson is bringing him along. I think he's earned some additional time. And I think you saw that last night where he's getting basically CJ Gunn's minutes in the first half. Um, and I think he is a guy comparative to the others where his role is a little bit more defined. He isn't a guy who is going to feel compelled to drive. So he's either going to take the, a wide open shot if he gets it, which he was able to do last night, or he's a good guy to feed the post, as coaches brought up many times, that he's one of the best post feeding uh, you know, players that we have on the team. And that plays in well to what the team wants to do. And he's not going to take stuff off the table because he's not going to make glaring mistakes. Um He's not going to make spectacular mistakes in, in in some ways. And so, you know, I think kudos to him for carving out a bigger role. I think there's also an argument to be made that the more you play him, the more that his flaws, whether that be defensively or or otherwise, do show up um, if you play him too much in those scenarios. But I do think it's reasonable to think that he can continue to build a little bit on the minutes that he gets. I don't think particularly with X back that a starting role is in his future uh, by any stretch, but I think he can continue to to build on what he's done. And I think he's earned the right to build on what he's done uh, as we go forward. So we'll, we'll kind of monitor that as we go. All right. We got uh, three big picture questions. I'm going to hit two of them uh, and kind of use the other one, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of use the other one as a way to plug another podcast. So we'll, uh, we'll hit that one in a minute. Uh, first one is from Brian. Um, what are your thoughts on the new Baylor University basketball arena, specifically whether a similar project could be done at IU? Took less than five years for grand opening of Baylor's arena after its initial proposal. I'm on Ryan's side. IU needs an arena, but understand IU doesn't have some of Baylor's advantages uh, there. So, you know, Ryan, uh, I guess I'll throw that one to you since your your name was uh, invoked during the asking of the question. So uh, thoughts on 
anything that you saw that, that maybe is transferable from what Baylor did to something that IU could do uh, if if somebody wants to pull the trigger on it on a new facility? What was I mean? Other I haven't read a whole lot about Baylor's facility. I've seen it small, but I, I yeah seventy five hundred seventy five hundred. Like I didn't. It, was there anything else that was noteworthy? I think just the time. It? I think just the timeline uh, of it of it being. Uh, something you could get up to speed on pretty quickly. Yeah, and and it's impressive they did that. I did read that part as well. Um, I think it's, I mean, obviously there's no one-to-one here because Indiana would be twice that size minimum. Uh, I'm not sure if you need 18,000 since we've seen the balcony is rarely full anymore. Um, but, you know, I... I, I mean, I think that, that Indiana, it's just about commitment and it, and it's about commitment from donors too. You need the money. I mean, you know, the money doesn't, doesn't present itself out of thin air. Baylor has insanely deep pockets for those who don't know. Uh, and I think that, you know, Indiana could do something like that with the will to do it. And, um, you know, I, I love assembly hall for what it is, but I've said for a long time, I think that, if you are going to be a premier basketball program, you need a premier facility. And and and, the, and unfortunately, Assembly Hall, other than for the atmosphere, and I love the atmosphere at Assembly Hall, and I love when it gets loud, and, and I love the fan. But from an aesthetics point of view, it's not a great place to watch a basketball game. I mean, in most of the seats are not great. Um, and so if people have seats in certain areas, they may choose just not to come, especially the students. So I, I do think a new arena is needed. Uh, I mean, I know it's general admission for the students, but if they're at the back of the line or something, they might just go to Knicks to watch the game. Um, I really think that Indiana could have a premier facility. I think that that atmosphere will travel with the team. Um, you can do things to increase acoustics and stuff like that. But I also think that that atmosphere is about the fan base, not the building. And there are a lot of special things that happen in that building. Uh, but I think you can translate that to another building. So I, that's my feeling. And I, I think it just takes the commitment financially and it takes the commitment of the university to get it done. I've said this many times in right after I graduated, I think it was like 2007, the board of trustees approved a new arena. They thought they needed a new arena and it never happened. Um, new athletic director came in, you know, there were changes, whatever. And it was put on the back burner and then they just decided to give assembly hall a facelift, which I like to facelift, but it didn't solve all the problems. So, um, you know, I, I just think that Indiana is capable of more. All right. Next question is from Greg. Uh, there was an assumption that where an Mbaco would be one and done this year. That probably isn't happening. So what does next year's team look like with them? And at least the addition of, of McNeely coach, I'll throw this one to you first. I, I guess first is, do you agree with the premise that that probably isn't happening? Uh, and then, Obviously, the next year question becomes a little bit tough to look at with the transfer portal and things like that. But uh, so kind of take that one, whichever yeah. uh, direction you want. G Greg, initially, uh, I would say I don't agree. Respectfully, I don't agree with the assumption that Ware and Mbaco are coming back. Um, the The wild card there is the NIL money yeah. and potential draft, uh, you know, where they go and see where they're going to be drafted in. Um, but I, I think... Ware has played well enough now that he's probably going to go. Um, Mbaco is the is the wild card there of the two about coming back or staying. But I think the mentality of uh, that he had with being a five star and going to Duke and doing that that he wants to he wants to go now. Whether he gets the advice that he's not going to be drafted or he's going to be in the G League and he can still make some money. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if both of them are gone. In fact, I've been operating under the assumption that both of them will be gone. Uh, if they're back and you have a guy like McNeely, uh, the hope is that McNeely then can can shoot the basketball uh, and, and be a, a consistent uh, three. Or the, the concern about uh, not McNeely, the player, but McNeely, the usage, is he going to be another Miller cop? Um, we see what Miller cop's doing in the G League right now. He's like shooting like crazy. Uh, getting volume of shots. Uh, Imagine that. Um, yeah, and, and you know, but I think McNeely apparently does a little bit more. Somebody's job to get shots from Miller Cop, <laughs> and do, he's doing a fine uh, job. We of know it. who's it's not, but it's somebody's job apparently. You know, I don't know the league, but if someone needs a ten day contract and they need to replace a shooter, uh, you, you don't know if in a year or two he keeps playing like that. If he doesn't get a little bit of run uh, at, at at some point. Um, but anyway, I, I think 
Um, you with McNeely, if you have both of those guys back, it's obviously going to be a better roster. I, I think McNeely's a special player. I, I don't think he is the answer, though. The automatic answer showing up in Indiana is going to go to the Final Four or even if those guys are back. I, I think the, the issues with the program still have to be answered uh, with fundamentals uh, and play and style before I can say that. So roster construction is one big piece, uh, and McNeely adds an outside presence that would help those guys. I, I still think you need another two or three guards. Uh, when, when you look at Illinois and don't uh, the Domask guy, or I'm, I'm not pronouncing that right, but the guard who dropped 32 the other day came from – um, the Missouri Valley, I think the, kid at, Illinois, the Jones kid. Say. Yeah. The kid at, uh, Purdue that is starting and been an effective player for Purdue, uh, came from the same league. Uh, those guys are out there. They're not the five star. They're not the NBA guys, but if you watch those guys play, they can flat out play the game in the big 10. Um, so identifying those are just as important as getting, I think actually identifying some of those guards. And losing where I Emin mean, is probably more important. Not, I don't want them to leave, but if we do lose them, getting those types of guards um, are, are are more important, uh, some somewhat than having the bigs back. I, I think we got to transition to one or two bigs and f- eight guards. But I've been saying that for years. Yeah, I think you know. Just to to piggyback on what you said, I, I think if you look at it, I, I am not operating under the assumption. I think where in particular. I'd be hard pressed to really create a scenario where he'd be back. I think he's answered a lot of the questions about him. His skill set is is impressive, and what the NBA is looking for. I, I really struggle to find a scenario where he'd be back. And even if Mbako came back, you know, the the you you could start a, a lineup of renew at the five, then you can move Mbako to the four, and then McNeely to the three because that's what he really is. Where does that leave you in the backcourt? Like those are the questions that need to be addressed with the roster. Whether those guys come back or not, as Coach said, you're going to have very similar questions about backcourt production as you do this year, particularly given some of the questions about what's the development of CJ and things like that. So, I, I think that really is the 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 biggest need, no matter what those guys decide, uh, as you look ahead to uh, to what next year might hold. Uh, and then the last question from Alex, how much time do you think is an appropriate amount of time until you can say whether or not your head coach is the guy? Uh, while this is probably a show of its own, uh, this feels like as good an opportunity as any to plug uh, the X's and Joe's podcast that uh, that Bob Motes and uh, Mike Weymouth uh, have been doing. They've got two episodes out. This the, the one this week was in particular kind of about this uh, in terms of the honeymoon period with coaches and uh, and how that's looked at. So uh, would definitely encourage people to to talk through that. And I think this in particular would be a good question, uh, really regardless of how this the rest of this, this season plays out, to uh, to really dive into in the offseason. So I, I think in the interim, uh, listening to their episode would be a great start. Uh, I know I've enjoyed the first couple episodes of that. Uh, and so I think um, I'll kind of I'll kind of answer that question by pointing uh, pointing Alex and anybody else who's interested in that kind of question in that direction. All right, so with that, uh, that'll wrap it up for this week's edition of the Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live, you can join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday night, the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. Thanks to Bob Thompson for producing our music, which you all know and love, but just didn't hear much of tonight. And thanks to John Ringer of rigdesign.com for designing our logos. And thank you for listening. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim, and go Hoosiers. All right, fellas. I think we got to most yep. of the questions. And uh, apparently, everyone needs to go to Twitter and look at Victor Wembanyama highlights. Uh, yeah. uh, apparently, Giannis. I somebody put it in my text, and Giannis called for an ISO against him, like a screen to switch into an ISO, and went right on him. And Wembanyama just rejected him at the rim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good stuff. Good yeah. stuff. I will go check that out. So, right. all right. Sounds good, guys. Right. Good stuff. Glad to do the mailbag. Kind of changed direction yep. a little bit from, uh, I mean, not that most of the it's questions were rooted in uh, the game yesterday, but at least it was a little bit different way to tackle it instead of rehashing some of the same stuff. So appreciate all the great questions, everybody. Yeah. We definitely didn't need good. to revisit the game from last night. Yep. And um, 
as you guys leave, I'm going to play around with this soundboard. So if there's someone that is uh, silly enough to stick around in the chat and tell me if you can hear music or not, I'm going to try a new settings. Uh, if not, there's 149 of you. Maybe I can get one or two poor souls to stick around for five minutes as I mess with this <laughs> damn board. Uh, I hate sucking. Uh, so I'm going to work, but I don't expect so, uh, the, Jared, uh, if you're listening, pull that audio. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, I, I'm, I'm going to do some stuff. So all have right. Good night. You two best, uh, of, you best of luck to that. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess we'll be back. I think I am out on Saturday, Ryan. I think you're in, Jared, I'm in, in. Yeah. coach. You'll I'm be in, there. but I'll be at the game. So I'll yep. pop in halfway through. Okay. All right. Awesome. Sounds See good. We'll guys. talk to everybody then. Okay, so now for those of you listening, I am not hearing that. Is you're anyone hearing the Back that Home uh, on presented by Home YouTube Field or wherever you're watching? So it shut off for me. It's not. You're hearing it, Bryce. You're hearing it. So low. Did that help any? If I turned up the volume, low volume. Okay, let me go. Ninety-eight percent volume there. It better here. Low and comes in and out. So I, yeah, no, no, no. Okay. Um, Still no. He remembers the days when the movie cost a dollar. And they help you if you no, ever had a pocket dollar. Play hard, but remember fake hustle is a crime. Uh, He's that's the John. Just on so in and out, in and out. Uh, all right, I got to figure out the settings. The sad thing is, thanks for those of you sticking around. I played sound bites um, for the guys, and they heard them. And then I went to the live, and it's doing this stuff. So it just flipped on me. I'm going to try something else. I apologize for these sounds. These are just movie clips. Um, so I'll try to find one that's halfway decent. Hey, is this heaven? No. Uh, did you hear that? Uh, I think it was filled to dreams. I did not hear it. I'm going to try one more. This is a simple game. I don't know if that came through. You heard it. That's good. So why is that one, that part of the soundboard working, but not my assembly call soundboard is working. So this is going to be a gong. You guys hear that. And it's like normal music, right? Normal sound. Okay. So that says assembly call podcast. Let me try this gong again. It just started a recording. Okay, so there's something wrong with when the recording device I'm using with the music. I'll play it one more time. Sorry for the splits. Yeah, it's just a it's just a quick one. Um, this is State Class of San Diego. Here at New movie. Center for. I'm Ron Burgundy. You stay classy, San Diego. Any luck with that? All right. Let me try this. These are Mrs. Tonsoni's clips. Catch me if you can, Coach T. Coach Tonsoni is always right about basketball. Can you hear the wonderful Mrs. Tonsoni? 
Well, maybe it's just her. If you don't get off that show, I'm making you eat carrots. I still can't hear. Let me see what... Uh... I thank you so much for sticking around. Dale, I owe you a beer out in right field. Um, and anyone else, if you come down for baseball or basketball games, I owe you for helping me with this. So I... Okay. Oh, technology is a wonderful thing. So you heard Mrs. Tonsoni clips. Uh, do you hear Coach Woodson clips? Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Brad, I owe you one. Loud and all you guys, I got to come up with the... That's defense. The Woodson clips, do they come through? Good, good, good. I heard you say one word. Okay, now let me go back and play the opening thing that no one could hear, the banner moment. I'm playing that. Can you hear the banner moment intro? No. Okay, so. Oh, hold it the plug the national championship. Default assembly call podcast. It's the same setting. I promise I won't cuss, but I feel like it. I have the same settings for those two. Hey, so you hear the this, show's right? Over. Here, I come, Coach Sony, here I come, Coach Tonsoni. And it cuts in and out. So on this soundboard, I have like eight soundboards within the one program. I'm going to go back to. Mrs. Tonsoni soundboard clips. Hey, the show's over. Here I come, Coach that's Tonsoni. Okay. So I've identified where the problem is. Coach Tonsoni is always right. That's right, Amy. About I'm basketball. always right. Something is wrong with this assembly call part of it. Okay. Uh, thank you, guys. A hundred of you are stuck. I owe a lot of beers. 90, 95 people have stuck around for this absolutely old man trying to figure out technology. Um, thanks, guys, for hanging around. I appreciate it. Things will get better. It's always Indiana basketball. Um, yeah, they're fighting against each other when you play assembly call. Yeah, I, I, um, I can't hear any of this all of a sudden. So there's something I got to figure out in order to hear. I can see the sound waves on the board, so I know when to shut it off and when to to not turn it on. But I, I care more about you guys hearing it, and then it goes out to the recording um, for the podcast. Uh, one more one more thing, uh, Meaningful Moment song. Meaningful moments that you might have missed. Any luck there? I don't, I wouldn't think so. It's in the same problem area. I'm going to try one more thing. Here's the intro. Is this intro working? The You're opening. listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. Okay, so let me ask you a couple questions. You're... You hear the sound bites of like Mrs. Tonsoni and Coach Woodson, the clearest day, perfect, normal sound. But when I go back to play the intro, it cuts in and out and it's choppy and it fades and it's in and out. Is that a correct statement? Oh, she is. Uh, Mrs. Tonsoni's cutting in and out too. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to have to put Jared on this one. I appreciate your help. Yeah. Oh, cutting in and out on the back home network. All right. Very good. Sound bites are good. Music is bad. Thanks, Bryce. That, that's how an old guy has to understand all this. Uh, you put it in very simple phrases. Uh, as an old coach, I, I, I need some simplicity in my life sometimes. Anyone going to be down? Any of the 96 of you going to be down Saturday to the game? Would love to stop and say hello if you are. Thanks, Justin.
All right, I think I'm going to call it a night. Um, everyone, take care of yourself. Be good. And uh, if you're in Bloomington at some point, I would ur urge you, Dale and I met at the baseball game, had a great night talking baseball. Uh, if you, um, you know, make sure that if you have a chance to get to Bloomington in the spring for some baseball, get a hold of me, let me know, or try to see if I'm there. Love to sit around and, and have a beer with you or something to talk baseball. The baseball program is going to be really, really good. And, and, and Bart Kaufman is beautiful. If you have not been there, it's a, it's, I think it's a destination place. So, um, <laughs> Howie, this is a, a, come on now, Howie. I like the way you think, but Howie's going to get banned for inappropriate stuff. Uh, thanks. I'm Brad. We appreciate you guys too. It, it means a lot. I uh, appreciate your help. I, I am going to sign off. Go give the loved one in your life a hug. Uh, be good. And we'll see you around. Peace, everybody.